still the policy recommendations in some views may differ. It is a, it is a classical balance of payment crisis, I will argue, but uh, of course not with everything being equal. I will try to point out the differences. I speak about the bubble, uh, this crisis, the two options for Euro, and come to my conclusions. So the bubble which we had in Europe resulted from the interest convergence. You have seen that with the announcement of the Euro, all the interest rates converged. They were very, very different. Greece had interest rates of 25% and now again. And Italy had, and Spain and Portugal had five percentage points more interest than Germany. Germany is always the lower, at the lower end of the spectrum. And uh, you see that already the Madrid summit in December 1995, uh, which specified the date when the physical euro would come, caused the interest convergence for obvious reasons. And uh, that implied that in the southern countries, uh, cheap money was available. They borrowed in Greece to pop up the government sector in Ireland and Spain. It was the construction sector that absorbed foreign credit. In the end, it met up in uh, Greece, the government employees built homes, and in Spain, the construction workers paid taxes, so the respective other sector was automatically in the game. The big bubble, which was inflationary, took place and created huge current account deficits in these countries, which then had to be financed. But you see, Obviously, it was only a temporary phase of history in which the euro, uh, in, during which the euro was able to bring about an interest convergence. These countries couldn't pay back their debt before they came into the euro. They can't do it now. In the meantime, we had the illusion that they would. Here you see the price changes that took place since the Madrid summit until Lehman, um, and uh, obviously there was uh, an enormous uh, change in relative prices, Germany being at the lower end, as you see here, the others inflated a lot. These are the GDP deflators. And they imply that the cheap countries with two eyes, is Italy, appreciated by exactly 30% relative to their trading partners in the Eurozone, while Germany depreciated by 22%. These are astronomical numbers. And that is the problem. The, the competitiveness disappeared. The prices are somewhere in the sky. Uh, current account deficits, no one wants to finance them any longer. In order to rebalance, we need a realignment of prices, but that's easier said than done in a current situation. We have to rewind the clock, but the clock likes to go only in one direction. Well, Brookman said it's completely impossible. Well, he has a point. Let's look to the uh, real exchange rates in, uh, defined as GDP deflators relative to the rest of the euro. Here you see the Greek uh, relative price level. Lehman is equal to 100. Uh, they appreciated during the crisis. Okay, they had a VAT increase, but the appreciation was even more than that. Here you see Italy, no sign of a real depreciation whatsoever. Portugal, France, Spain, nothing. You may have seen the recent study of Goldman Sachs according to which Spain would have to depreciate by 20%, Portugal by 35%, Greece by 30%, Italy by 10-15%, in order to find a new situation. <coughs> this is simply not happening. But there's one country where it is different. And I show you this I, because Paul Putin showed another graph yesterday. So I thought I, I briefly uh, spent a moment on this graph. You see that Ireland did depreciate. The, the curve he shows about the wage per hour doesn't really reflect it because there was a productivity increase. So Ireland had an enormous real depreciation by 15% since 2006. Why Ireland and why not the others? Well, first of all, they are more flexible. They always wanted to be American. But the main point is uh, the crisis began earlier in 2006. At that time, there were 
singled out. Uh, there was no crisis perception, no rescue programs, no particular programs of the ECB. They had to help themselves, and so they cut their prices. While the others, when they come, came into trouble, jointly organized auxiliary programs through the ECB, through the EU, which made it unnecessary to have uh, realignments of prices. The bubble burst when the American crisis swept over in the summer of 2007 to Europe, and in particular with Lehman a year later. The capital markets were no longer willing to finance uh, these countries. The question is who financed them? The answer is the ECB. So here we come to the balance of payment crisis. The paper to which I allude, uh, we published, uh, we, we had in the first version last June. Many of you have seen that, and this is the final version uh, uh, that will be going to print, which uh, will lie here somewhere, with the most recent data. To fix ideas, let me try to help you with this. Uh, this is Europe. These are payments <coughs> flows in all directions for buying goods, for credit contracts, for buying assets, anything. Uh, and uh, a balance of payment equilibrium in, in the particular countries is such that there are no net flows of money across the borders. Here I showed in green um, the uh, credit flowing, the money flowing in terms of credit from the core to the periphery. And yellow is uh, the payments for buying goods in net terms in the core. These things were all balancing out until 2007. But then, all of a sudden, there was a stop. The capital didn't flow anymore, and the green arrows are missing. Still, they want to buy their Volkswagens. So the outflowing money is still there, but there is no money flowing. And even worse, there is a, an outright capital flight in so far as uh, the banks of Central Europe not only stop financing the current account deficits, but withdraw their existing stocks of credit, given that they have all short-term maturity, they just didn't revolve the credit. And so uh, the, uh, the periphery countries even had to send more money to the center to redeem their debt. Now, the net amount of money that through this process was flowing to the center is what, we, what is measured by the target balance. It's exactly that. It's the money that electronically was flowing across the borders. If I speak of money flows, money printing, threading, I always mean electronic things. We don't have statistics about physical money flows. And uh, the target balances are accumulated balance of payment imbalances. It's exactly the same thing which we know from the test. It is reported in the balance sheets because if a payment order comes, say, from Greece to Germany, then the Bundesbank has to credit the amount in favor of uh, the recipient of the money. It gives the credit by carrying out this payment. And in exchange, it gets a claim against the ECB system. And the central bank, from where the money is sent, gets a liability which is shown in its balance sheet. Those, so these things were hit in the balance sheets and uh, uh, finding them and, and making a systematic database out of it was quite a cumbersome process, I can tell you. That is up to this date, as far as I know, not yet uh, data based on the target balances. Maybe it is changing, but in autumn this was uh, what was said. So now comes the next stage of the story. The money cannot simply flow out of these countries, then the stock of money in circulation dwindles and they don't have enough for transactions, so they have to reprint the money. And actually it was exactly as much reprinted 
as was flowing up, as we show in the paper. So the target balances not only measure the net outflow of money, but also the money being reprinted and being given to the respective economies in terms of refinancing credit. So it's the extra refinancing credit beyond the normal refinancing credit and money printing for the internal circulation within these departments. Why was it so easy to reprint the money which was flowing out? The Deutsche Bank was not giving credit to a Greek bank anymore. So the customer was not able to uh, buy the Volkswagen the borrowed money from the Deutsche Bank. Well, the money came from the ECB, from the printing press instead. Why was it so easy to print the money? After all, you would say we have a currency union with uh, lots of national central banks that they have formed even a center called ECB, and everyone has a printing press in the basement. Small country, Greece has a small printing press, Big country, Germany, has a big printing press. Somehow, the printing is in proportion to the size of the country. So it can't be that you just reprint the money, which is flowing out. But it is possible. It is possible. There are no restrictions, uh, except the one that you, uh, that the banks have to offer collateral, of course, when they want to have refinancing credit. And a small country has less collateral than a big country. So that's the only thing which proportions the amount of money to the size of the country. But this system of uh, portioning the money has been undercut by the ECB by regularly reducing the quality requirements for collateral. Until Lehman it was A minus, then it was B, B, B minus, then uh, there were, uh, they said two dates when they would be terminating this policy but they never terminated it. Then in addition, the rating requirement was waived for government bonds of Greece, Portugal, and Ireland, regardless of what the credit, uh, the rating agencies said, when, when they said this, these are trash bonds, doesn't matter, you could use them for refinancing operations. Then there were the ELA credit, uh, was the ELA credit emergency liquidity assistance where uh, as the National Central Bank could get to give out the credit even without refinance, uh, without collateral, or if with collateral according to its own decision because it was made like, usually if something goes wrong, all participating central banks share the loss, but in this case, it's only the national central bank. And then there were non-traded ABS papers created by the commercial banks where they put any, everything in which they found uh, these are the sausages which you very well know from the American system. You don't really know and don't want to know what kinds of ingredients went into the sausages. In uh, the case of Portugal, one has found um, uh, an asset bond uh, uh, with a maturity date at the uh, 31st of December, 9,999. And as far as I know, the rate of interest was zero. This is the reason why Jens Weidmann, the president of the Bundesbank, has written a letter to Mario Draghi complaining about this uh, insufficient securitization policy. <laughs> and now an additional 500 billion program is prepared where um, the uh, banks can even offer their credit titles against private companies as, uh, as collateral. Now let's look to the core. The money was flowing to the core countries. What happened there? Was the stock of money circulating exploding <coughs> as it should have been? No, because the money went into the shredding machine. The banks didn't need the extra liquidity, of course. They had the liquidity, they tried to offer it. They, in Germany, they offered it to the construction sector, and we have a building boom because of that. We have a very low interest rate. But as you know, if you offer the money, it doesn't disappear. It just goes from one account to the other one. So this extra liquidity was being uh, uh, invested in uh, the, the Bundesbank, was lent to the Bundesbank. And by doing so, it disappeared. This 
is just like the Bretton Woods system operated uh, at the time when we had fixed exchange rates. Uh, the Fed was printing money uh, uh, excessively. The money was used to buy goods and assets in Europe. Uh, the European sellers uh, brought uh, the dollars to their respective national central banks, converted them into domestic currency, and we in Germany at the time had quote unquote dollar Deutschmarks in circulation, which crowded out the refinancing Deutschmarks, which were the new, the normal Deutschmarks there. So the refinancing credit shrunk while America expanded its refinancing credit at the time. It's exactly the same phenomenon that we have in Europe. At the time, we were saying that Europe finances the Vietnam War. One tolerated that. You know, one guy didn't tolerate it, uh, uh, Jean de Gaulle, and he sent a warship to America to get the gold back. Uh, he succeeded, and then America said, not another time. That was the end of the Bretton Woods system. This is the only difference. We can't send a warship to Greece uh, to ask the Greece to give us gold in exchange. But the, pro the process goes very far. By the end of last year, 93% of the monetary base of the Eurozone was created in the four, five crisis countries. And I guess by now it's more than 100%. I don't have the number. All the money in the Eurozone comes from Greece, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. It is a process of converting the service, the savings. We have um, Germans have savings. They uh, bring their money to their banks, hope that uh, the banks have own some marketable assets in exchange, but they don't. Increasingly, they have all just claims against the Bundesbank, and the Bundesbank has a claim against the ECB system. And this, for an average member of the active population, is 15,000 euros already. And in the Netherlands, it's 17,000 euros. And in Finland, it's 21,000 euros. It's very easy to speak about rescue operations when you're sitting in America and speak about other people's money. But when you see it from the perspective of these countries, it is a very dubious operation. Here are the numbers. This is how the target balances, uh, namely the, the target debt of the chips <laughs> throughout Italy increased. And you see it's clearly here the breakdown of the interbanking market in 2007, which made this thing increase. And this is the corresponding German target claim. <coughs> the same numbers, but with another <coughs> opposite sign. And uh, it has increased to 660 billion euros by March. Here you see the Eurozone in explosion, in slow motion. <coughs> um, a breakdown by more countries you see here by the end of last year. Uh, you see that uh, like Germany, the Netherlands, Luxembourg and Finland are uh, creditor countries, and uh, among the debtor countries, there's also France. France will be a new topic because the French uh, target debt is rising rapidly. They published with a delay, a much longer delay than all others. We have to wait until June to have the March figures. We will have a surprise. This is for the GIFS countries, 655 billion. For all countries together for which we have the data today, it's already 900 billion target debt today. This number is by the end of last year. We are three months further ahead. 900 billion dollar target debt, uh, euros target debt. What do the target, what does the target finance have to do with the current accounts? Well, there is, of course, a budget constraint for the economy. Uh, the current account uh, is usually financed with the capital account. If it is not financed with the 
capital account, you have to give money away, and uh, you can reprint that money. So the target debt, the, the increment in the target debt, plus uh, the capital import, by definition, is equal to the current account. And the current account therefore has to be financed either with target or target debt or with uh, normal usual capital imports in, that include uh, rescue programs. We will see for the different countries how it works. This is the target curve for Greece, as you know it from the previous graph, uh, starting in 2007. And the blue curve shows the accumulated current account deficit of Greece starting by the 1st of January 2008. And the starting point was put at the same level where the yellow curve is at that point in time. So then the uh, accumulated number is from the beginning of the crisis you can see here. And what you see is basically uh, they end up after four years at the same point, meaning that over these four years, Nearly 100% of the accumulated current account deficit of Greece has been financed with the printing press. In the public, often one has the impression the crisis is a current, new, intense phenomenon starting, let's say, in May 2010. In fact, the rescue operations began much earlier through the ECB system. Greece has been cut off from the capital market uh, since the beginning of 2008. We are in the fifth year of entirely financing that country. <coughs> the aggregate credit and haircut help, which Greece has received up to this day, is nearly exactly 500 billion euros, while the national income of Greece is 180 billion euros. Some people say we need to have the Marshall Plan for Greece. If one calculates the percentages of the Marshall Plan, Greece would have been entitled to re receive 4 billion euros, not 500 billion euros. This is Portugal. Very similar, you see the difference was Portugal did have some normal capital import here until 2009, but then in the second half of 2009 there was a capital flight, and all the capital that had come before disappeared again, so that some over the four years, basically it's the same story as in Greece. Entire financing of the current account deficit with target money, with printed, reprinted money. Ireland, very different, small current account deficit, huge capital flight, obviously. Spain, until last summer, it seemed okay, only a quarter of the current account deficit was uh, target financed, but then again the capital flight from Spain in the summer. And it is so huge that even Spain now, if we aggregate over these four years, uh, has, uh, has no surplus of uh, uh, private capital inflows. And finally, the same story for Italy, it's even worse. Uh, the capital flight was so enormous that all the capital that had come since the beginning of the crisis had disappeared and even more. Germany received for its current account surplus, by the way, no marketable assets, but only money printed elsewhere. Not a single marketable asset was acquired for the current account surplus, which we had in the, with the other countries of the Eurozone over the last four years. Not a single euro. Why is, <coughs> why is the target credit the problem? First, these are fiscal rescue operations circumventing the parliaments. The stocks of money balances don't change, neither in the countries nor in the aggregate. Eurobonds will necessarily follow because there is only one way to bring the money back. Uh, you have to collectively insure private capital flows into these countries. We have
have a uniform interest policy of the ECB, despite the different uh, credit risks, which distorts the markets. Basically, since we are way beyond uh, a sudden crisis procedure, but in, in a normal long run situation already, I would say you're having now, it's a little bit provocative, <laughs> a central planning agency that runs the capital market in Europe. And, of course, the printing press chases the interbank credit away and causes the capital flight. The money which you pump into these economies either maintains the current account or it flows out again immediately. There is no third possibility. Either you help to finance a current and maintain a current account deficit or you cause the capital flight which you pretend to fight against. And in the end, you maintain the wrong price vector in the resulting current account deficit, as I said. How is it in America? You know that better. Uh, we have the ESA system here, just two graphs. This is the uh, sum of the uh, positive ESA balances in the United States relative to the GDP in the United States. And you know, in April, uh, one has to hand over interest bearing assets from <coughs> one district fed to another district fed, which means a debt redemption. Here, in anticipation, the district fed gave less uh, refinancing credit, so that was a behavioral effect. Here, 190 billion dollars were paid, and here again now, this is the latest data for this April, uh, there is a redemption. So in America, this is not a problem, <coughs> but here, see Europe. This is the European gross target uh, debt relative to GDP. It's exploding because there is no gap. Europe has two choices. Either we go uh, uh, this way, that we leave the easy access to the printing press, target credit, then we uh, need uh, euro bonds to compensate for that. And in order for the countries not to abuse that, we need political debt constraints. That's the European way. I, I, I don't think it will ever work because these political debt constraints will not be over. And the other one is the American way, liability of states, interest spreads, state can, can go bankrupt, and you have to settle the target balances. Thereby, it's not attractive to draw the credit out of the system. Of course, America has fiscal equalization schemes, so I don't want to be so harsh as uh, not to offer any help. Here, I advise you to the EAG report. This is a, a crisis-like procedure with liquidity help and, uh, and uh, sliced uh, haircuts and so on, and Brady bond types of things, which I don't want to explain in detail. So my conclusion, we have a balance of payment crisis caused by current account imbalances caused by the cheap credit in the initial years of the euro. Uh, the eurozone now has to rewind the clock. Uh, some prices are too high and have to decline. We have to inflate in Germany. We don't want to inflate. They, the other countries don't want to cut their prices, so we are in, in, in a very, very difficult situation. I, I can imagine that the euro will, be, will not survive because of this problem. Uh, 900 billion target, ECB causes capital flying, it maintains current account imbalances by its policies. The US model is better because it has harder budget constraints. Janusz Kornai, 1980, predicted the fall of communism because of soft budget constraints. We should not make the same mistake of running, trying to run Europe without hard budget constraints. Thank you for your attention.